if you had a high opinion of Paul McCartney before tonight, I'm about to take it even higher. I was running this rock station, but I also was on the board of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And as you probably know, Make-A-Wish grants wishes to terminally ill children. And usually when there was something, a request for concert tickets or something, I would get a phone call saying, Bo, can you help? And I always try to. Um, but this call came in from a 19-year-old young woman named Kelly who was suffering from brain cancer. And Kelly's one wish was to meet Paul McCartney. I mean, couldn't you ask for somebody bigger, for God's sakes? <laughs> Um, so I reached out to Paul's management company and record label and said, we have an unusual request. Paul is going out on tour. Can he spare a few minutes to meet her? Uh, and the answer came back from everybody asked, we're really sorry. But this is Paul's first American tour since John Lennon's been killed. And he really doesn't want to expose himself at all. So he's going to play his shows. He's going to go back to the hotel. He's going to go to the airport and fly on. He's not doing any press. He's not meeting anybody. Please tell her that we respectfully just can't. So I went back and told Kelly and her mom that I tried. It's just not going to happen. Is there anything else I can do for you? And they went, no, that's really all she wanted. And it broke my heart. And I didn't mean to do it. But I played a card that I, I didn't want to play. And I called Paul's people back. And I said, you know, Paul has a 19-year-old daughter named Stella, who's a famous fashion designer now. And she's perfectly healthy. Can you imagine the horror of having a 19-year-old daughter that's not healthy, that has three months to live? and her only wish is to meet Paul McCartney. Can you please just shake her hand and, and, and spend a minute with her? And a couple of days later, they came back and said, OK, he will. But there's one condition, and the condition is nobody can know. Paul isn't doing this for credit. He doesn't want the press to know. He doesn't want anybody reporting on it. He's doing it because he's a dad and he cares. So we were back at the kingdom, and we were told to be at this special gate, Kelly and her mom and I. And we sat there until someone guided us back through the building. And we walk into the kingdom, which is 60,000 seats, and it's empty. It's just chairs, except for the band is warming up on stage. And we get walked way back into the bowels of the building into this green room. And we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, the curtain parts. And here's Paul, and he says, Kelly? And he comes walking towards her, and Kelly stands up to shake his hand, and he brushes by her arm and hugs her. And Linda hugs her. And Linda had brought a, a stuffed bear for Kelly that she gave to them. Now, I don't know if any of you have met famous celebrities or sports stars or whatever. You have a chance to do a meet and greet. But usually, it's a hi, hello, nice to meet you. Let's take a picture. And then the next people come in. And I thought, if that's what we had to deal with, that's what we had to deal with. After all, it is Paul McCartney. But what Paul did is he sat down on one side of Kelly. And Linda sat down on the other. And they talked to her for half an hour. And they told her jokes, and they told her how pretty she looked, even though she had no hair and had bought a new beret and a new dress. And they made her laugh, and they talked about peace, and they looked her right in the eye, and she was just completely in awe. And I look over at, at Kelly's mom, who's watching this, and she's got tears running down her face because she's seeing her daughter realize her greatest wish. Uh, Paul stayed for a half an hour, stood up, and then took pictures with everybody. And I expected him to say, thanks, have a good time, I'm going to leave now. So as everybody's shaking hands and saying goodbye, Paul goes, oh, we're not done yet. And he leads us out into the kingdom and walks us over to these merchandise tables. And he said, are you about a medium? And he's grabbing stacks of shirts and stacks of sweatshirts and jackets and ball caps. I mean, she's you know, like buckling under the weight of all this stuff. He says, now follow me. And he sits us right here. This is in a stadium where the first three seats center. And he jumps up on stage and does what's called a sound check, a rehearsal, to make sure that the sound levels for all the instruments are correct. And he and the band played half a dozen songs. And whenever they played a song that had someone's name in it, I remember the song Get Back, where he says, Get Back JoJo. He replaced Kelly's name wherever he could. And he smiled, and he winked, and he was just wonderfully charming. And when he was done, he jumped off the stage, and he gave her a big hug. And he said, I've got to go get something to eat and get ready for the show. Are you gonna, am I going to see you at the show tonight? And she said, well, it was sold out. I didn't get a chance. We couldn't get tickets. And he said, let me take care of that. And he reaches in his pocket, and he pulls out three laminated passes. He goes, we're going to put three chairs on the sound board, which is right where the sound is the best, in the middle of the venue, and you're my guest tonight. And then away he went. And we stood there in the parking lot looking at each other afterwards like, did that really happen? Could somebody be that 
much of a hero in real life. It was really something to see. And that's a lot of what I got to see in my experiences. That's one of the few in my book that are not about sex, drugs, and rock and roll, but about the humanity of, of some of these people that you meet that are just so remarkable when you meet them in person. But Paul couldn't have been more of a hero. And uh, this is a picture that was taken of Paul with Kelly. <laughs> 